Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 20. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of God. Today, uh, we are uh, continuing on the study of the um, uh, current issues. And I, I said this before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about the truth will set you free. I kind of laid down some of the things um, the Word of God being the basis for all that, um, that is true uh, and uh, life-giving. And so it, it is uh, uh, from that sermon, uh, last time we talked about sanctity of life, uh, and today we are talking about genders and the gender issues uh, and, and so forth. And uh, next week we're going to wrap, wrap it up with um, um, then how does the mass uh, the population believe and how they behave and how, how does the enemy uh, uh, manipulate that as well. And I think it is very um, important uh, study for us to understand the tactics of the evil one. And the scripture often talks about we, we know we are not ignorant of the schemes of Satan. And the Bible spells it out as well. So we, we are going to just talk about that. But this has become um, an issue. Uh, if you can... Kind of remember back about 10, 15 years ago, this was not even an issue in the United States. Um, very minor population uh, have, you know, come through this. Uh, and so uh, let me start with this. Um, this is uh, Zhang Zi, a uh, poem, and one of the poems, it starts like this. Once upon a time, I dreamt that I was a butterfly uh, fluttering hither and thither, to all intents and purposes, a butterfly. I am conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was myself. Soon I awaked, and there I was, veritably myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I'm now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. And this is a profound confusion of identity and, and actually this this affords us and this is actually probably you heard it many times um, in, in psychology and also in philosophy how do I know who I am right this is a fundamental thing your, your identification and the, how do you affirm or deny um, you know, that piece of information. So today we're going to start with this because it's such a postmodern uh, uh, question uh, that we are starting with today. Now, gender issue, understanding that you are a boy or a girl, is not another piece of information. It's a fundamental to who you are. Besides your name, 
the family you belong to or clan you belong to, uh, sometimes your race you belong to, and the gender, they form the, the foundational understanding of who you are. From it, you build, um, you know, whether you are skillful in this area or you're competent in the sports, you compare yourself based on this basic information. So if you dislodge the gender, then, then you forever fall into perpetual vertigo of reality. Everything is sp spinning. Nothing is pegged down. And therefore, it is very important that we understand uh, this. Now, how did we get here? Um, and, and why has this become an issue? And is it important at all? Because, as I said about a couple of weeks ago, this is a prominent postmodern value of absolute relativism. That is, everything is relative. There is no absolute truth. Therefore, I can choose whatever the data to back up my viewpoint. I can live in my bubble of truth with a, with a Facebook friends and um, you know, whatever you have you who, who share the same value. And we don't have, we are not accountable to quote unquote objective truth, which doesn't exist, right? And therefore, the absolute relativism flows out naturally into selective use of data. In other words, everything is similar, so I choose my data uh, in favor, uh, and so that denying the objective truth, what is seen, what you can feel, denying that. And, and the, in the favor of subjective data, how I feel, how I perceive, uh, to convince oneself and others of an unsupported hypothesis, theory, the idea. And you support that with what? With your feeling. So what I feel is as good as what the historical, scientific, and, and the observable truth is same as that or better than that, okay? So that, that's where we, we start from. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And so um, there's a distinctive, why, why has this become a, such an issue? Because there's a distinctive way of, of people perceiving reality and truth. And um, uh, there, there's people called moderns. Moderns are the ones, you know, uh, especially uh, 19th century to early, um, uh, you know, I mean, mid, uh, until World War II, I will say, uh, a modern value. And, and since then, we, we, we live off of it. Baby boomers are generally moderns. Now, what they do is they observe or collect data they hear from, and they vet it, filter it out through uh, objective qualifications. Now, that is through history or science and, and, and the comparison and whatnot. So we know out of 10 pieces of information we receive, seven are valid and three are not. They cannot be verified. And after that, we, this is a particular kind of bent of moderns. They formulate out of this data that these are not all over the place. They formulate an equation or, or theory and upon which our, our actions or values and decisions are uh, uh, decided upon this formulation of, of values. Now, along with it, emotional as well. I get upset. You know, I didn't know about that. Now I know and think about it. This is something that is very serious. We shouldn't let it go, right? This is a lineal logic. The postmodern kind of began, especially uh, after the uh, World War II, uh, they... Uh, approach it differently and uh, and now it has but doesn't mean the postmodern we talked about it philosophically and everything else like Nietzsche talked about it and uh, all these things now is actually manifesting because as I mentioned before brave new world type of you know people's lives and and uh, dissipated and they're not interested in finding out the truth and 1984 type of uh, uh, of uh, restricting the uh, reasoning and uh, information and, and you know all those things happening both at a time so postmodernism happens so now there are not one piece of information we are processing we are processing millions of information going at, at a time and we have to just kind of a uh, 
viscerally cut off all these kind of things and go with impression, feelings, right? So out of the sea of information, we, we don't have time to process it. Now we have to respond it with a visceral response. Visceral is basic and coarse emotion, right? It's a fear, it's an attraction, especially sexual attraction, greed, anger, and these are the things. These are very, fun, this is very basic information. So we respond first, and after that, we formulate and decide to respond. And why, how do we do that? Because since we believe in absolute relativism, all the data are equal. And there are too many truths out there. We can pick and choose, and, and there's no consequences of that. So we choose whatever we feel like to support our emotion, visceral emotion or background. So it's a flipped out, right? Now, that can be instinctive. But at the same time, because we are now collecting data to support our already spent emotion, this is a circular logic, right? It's not linear anymore. We go around and around and around, right? The crow is a blackbird, and, and therefore blackbird is crow. So anything black can be crow, and you just go back and forth like this, right? And, and, and therefore, we are in a very precarious a place, and, and we can be easily manipulated as a crowd, as a mass. And this is why um, the councilwoman, AOC, uh, or Tacey, what was her name? Uh, I forget it. But, but she said, facts doesn't matter. It's immoral. And I say, how do you come to a conclusion immoral if you don't have right facts? But that doesn't bother the supporters or, or generation. That's where the problem is. And, and, and because of this, uh, therefore, this postmodern world, emotion and feelings outstrip, outstrips all other instruments for deciding reality, such as objective data and logical conclusion. Reasoning is bypassed because the emotional, instinctive response trumps everything else. Now, our brain can think like this. There's a book out, Thinking Fast, Thinking, thinking Slow. And we, we have intuitive response, right? All this data undefined, and we can sum it up, and we can respond immediately. And that's an incredible, incredible gift. At the same time, there's an analytical brain, so we can slow down and analyze all these things. These two things are necessary in our lives. But nevertheless, right now, the postmodern is more of an instinctive response and uh, visceral uh, for, for that reason. Therefore, postmodern world uh, and all that has become that. So objective truth, what you see visually, what you see, um, what you hear, and all that doesn't really matter now. Um, it has become a strange world. And you can be easily manipulated like a naked emperor. You can walk around naked, but that, the visual piece of information doesn't register because it's not important. But you are told that, that only certain people can see your clothes or whatever else. And because of that, what you see physically doesn't register. What you believe, I, idea, trumps whatever else. Right? Therefore, in order, to, in order to move the mass with their feelings, now storytelling, arts, music, social media are indispensable tools to shape the public opinion. This is where we are. Right? So what's in the Instagram, uh, what's, what's, what's in the Facebook or like, how many likes you get, it, it has the legitimacy. You have become... This is truth now. Has it been proven by, by research, dialogues, discussions? No, it doesn't matter. Because I got 1,000 likes. And this, is, this speaks 
right? Now, it has become that, and, and because of that, this is so, so dangerous for, you know, I mean, even the studies out there, the, especially uh, t the preteens and the adolescents and, and all that, and, uh, the, you know, their, their social um, media, they compare one another and, and all that, and it can be very dangerous, uh, and, and the self-esteem and everything else. So now, all of a sudden, content is important. Let me explain that. The content is the screenwriters and storytellers and Hulu, Netflix, Disney. Uh, and, and these people are going after these storytellers who can highlight certain ideas. Uh, I, you know... Uh, I say it in my sermon, I, I'm not a fan of Disney um, because it has an agenda uh, and to slide in homosexual LGBTQ ideas embedded in children's movies and videos. Um, and, and when a UAE, United Arab Emirates, and China, when they say, hey, we cannot handle this, you know, uh, unless you take it out, we cannot show it, they don't take it out. Their ideology is more important than profit. That's wickedness. You are introducing these ideas to children, K through what, whatever else, and the sexuality, gender is not even in the radar, and you are infusing that and confusing it purposely and intentionally, and that is wickedness. And, and these things are happening right now. This is not something that, uh, you know, all that. Why? Storytelling, video, arts, humor, especially humor, works like a charm. You, you, you are, um, you know, disarmed. And, and you can feed in anything. In 1980s and 90s, we used to have a word, videos. And, and you, have a, you have this uh, piece of document, and you, you play so many pieces of videos uh, in the music, and you know, like like uh, two minutes and five minutes, stuff like that. But in this video image is immoral, unacceptable, socially taboo stuff. In a split second, shows boom, 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 and you're playing the music and you're showing and all that. Your brain doesn't have ability or time to assess value. That should not be. That that that's wrong. And you don't have time for that. It passes so so fast. What happens, though, those images become normalized in your brain. That's videos, idiot by design video, right? And that's how you, I don't know, uh, condition a crowd and all that. And if you have a bad intention, that's, that's the way to go. That's why there are so many movies are made, contents are made, is a gender bending or, or genre bending uh, 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 dramas and movies, and people it's like approach like comedy, and yet there are the social issues, and then you bring them down to a, some kind of fantasy high five. Oh, but it's not real. We are not talking about reality, and then they bring it down to some kind of value, and all that kind of bending is so possible because we are conditioned for that, because our, our fundamental values, uh, I've been telling you this, we wouldn't be talking about a uh, gender issue if we ha don't have like a layered cake of lies. There's absolute relativism, and then you can uh, select the, val uh, the, the data, and, and with that, you can corrupt the data as well under, under artistry or creativity, and you, you rewrite the history, cancel culture, and you invite all these things and you can sell anything you want. This is where we are, right? And, and, uh, but this one particularly focuses on sexual and gender issue. Can you imagine me walking to Lakers office and say, I want to play the center position? Uh, look at you. What? I feel like seven foot four. I feel like I can jump. 36 inches vertical, standing still. You gotta be kidding. There's no such thing. Well, this information doesn't matter. It's what's in here. And you should honor what's in here. 
You know what pronouns are about? Is it, is it pronoun? You ask me my pronoun, I say, your majesty. <laughs> well, they say, that's not a pronoun. Who cares? You already messed up the grammar by using other pronouns, so who cares? Use a noun, right? Whenever you address me, your majesty, right? What, so what I believe you have to honor, you have no choice. You, you have no, no way of deciphering truth about your, uh, your uh, friends. And since when this is something acceptable? In fact, this gender issue, these are laughable, and these are not, these are not embraced by the rest of the world. We're trying to sell it, and there are some people, of course, in other parts of the world, uh, you know, whatever America does, one of them will jump in. But these are ridiculous ideas. The enemy has succeeded. This, this, is a, this is a hub from it. We're going to talk about our, our things later on, uh, the rest of the sermon. The enemy has succeeded in convincing this generation two major lies. Number one, you are entitled to choose whatever you want, even against the objective data. Number two, that all your problems are caused by someone else other than you. And ultimately, God. You can choose whatever you want. Because since everything is same, everything is relative, you can choose your race, you can choose your gender, you can choose what is truth, you can choose, you know, whatever else. You are the final filter of a reality, regardless of your education, your IQ, your experience, and whatever else, your feeling is absolute, and in which, through which you can choose the reality to live in. And the way you feel, if you are to find fault, it's not my fault. It's my parents' toilet training. It's, it's, you know, my father had a, a bankruptcy when I was growing up, and my, my mom moved too much. I, I went to three different schools, elementary schools, and this is why, who I am. You know, I, I, was, I, I was racially, you know, uh, uh, segregated or whatever else, uh, you know. So somebody else's fault, the way I feel. Nobody can tell me how I feel, but my feeling is absolute over against the objective truth. And to that, the scripture goes like this, in Romans chapter 9, 20, 21. It says, it's talking about the creator and created. And he's saying this, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The things molded will not say to the mortar, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have right over the clay to make them the same lump, one vessel for honorable use, another for common use. What I'm trying to say to you is this. Gender is gift of God. He did not haphazardly, incompetently assign it to us. It's a gift. Your nationality, your physical attributes... Everything is gift of God. Because God does not make junk. It's fearfully and wonderfully considered by omniscient and all-wise God. And that. Now, this generation, so point one, the number one lie, this generation considers gender as a form of avatar, an online presence which we can assume as we wish, even against the biological makeup according to their conditioned feeling, the manipulated feeling and desires. We are conditioned heavily by corporations and uh, policy makers and even researchers. Now, if, if you know anything about research, grant and uh, quotation by the peers dictates what kind of research you want to do. 
You don't want to get into research that nobody else quotes or they feel uh, embarrassed to quote. That happens, and I'm going to talk about that next week a little bit. That's how academia is forming and, and, and the ideas and, and uh, selling those things. And so who funds, who grants uh, the uh, research as well? So now all those things are in place. So people say, well, you know, I was born this way, and I, I did and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that really doesn't hold the water in, in, in some of the studies, and I, I'll show you if I have time today. But one of the uh, watershed moments uh, in mental health issue is uh, by John B. Uh, uh, what it, what it, Calhoun uh, in, in the late 1800s to uh, early 1900s, even to... Um, uh, you know, uh, mid 1900s. Uh, what he did was a study uh, of um, um, urban living. So he had a colony, you know, uh, for mice and later on rats. And, um, and you know, it's a clean place, food and water and everything, in, no disease, everything is removed. Uh, only thing that he did not provide was a space. Uh, so it, what is good for like uh, about 300 uh, you know, mice began with like you know, a few mice and then he grew up to 5,000. And uh, when the 5,000 reached, then he started to die uh, with no other reason than just overcrowded. And their behavior changed and all that kind of things. One of the first behavior change is courting and sexual activities. And uh, it becomes uh, very uh, uh, violent. Some males become very violent. And, uh, you know, they, 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 a lot of them have uh, exclusive homosexual activities. And they don't form the family. And uh, the, the female um, does not take care of the, uh, the babies anymore. And so forth and so forth. I'm not saying we are, we are rats and all that. But there, there's a commonality of something that is overcrowdedness and specialized society filled with stress, stress of being constantly plugged in, stress of being in this kind of things. Now, there is, what I'm trying to say to you is there is a shared, a va va the change in the shared value, and, and with it, the desire and the activities and, and, and all that kind of stuff. You cannot say there's nothing like that. So that's what I'm saying is the, the society, culture, values, wrong teachings can influence how people and what they desire, right? That's what I'm trying to, trying to say. So um, it's not like I can choose my gender because I feel this way, because uh, I was born this way. It's never the case. In fact, that nature or nurture discussion was hijacked in about 10 years ago. We no longer talk about that. Not because we have decided, we have come to conclusion. No, because it is unfashionable and you are a hater if you, if you even bring it up. And so that even academic community, whoa, I don't want to touch this. Why? Well, why should I be ostracized? Right? And then all that. So it's not because we came to scientific uh, uh, you know, a conclusion and all that, it just stopped. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's gone. So now, look at all this. This absolute relativism and selective use of data and corruption of data, and now we can, we can create our reality in whatever, in whatever shape that we want to, uh, and, and then we blame it to, uh, hey, I was born this way. You cannot back it up, but you feel like that. Nobody can challenge that either. Now, the second lie is all of a sudden, this is the things that are making it even worse. All of a sudden, professionals like a, a therapist and counselor, even medical doctors and, and all that, they are jumping into this. They are lumping all the unhappiness of adolescence into and all the unhappiness, confusion, awkwardness, pain, and need to fit in into gender dysphoria, in other words, I'm in the wrong body type of thing, and presenting it to naive teens and adolescents as a magic pill that dispel all their problems, right? Now, some of you are too old to remember your teenage days. 
But you have, your, even your kids went through teenage years a long time ago, so you can't even remember. Teenage period is it's a difficult time, is it not? I mean, it just what you're trying to find yourself. You want to fit in. How come my nose is so big and my face is small? My ears pop out. You know, how come it, it, pimple problems? And, and how come he's, he's a good athlete and he's popular? I cannot even make my friend. It's so painful to stand in front of people, self conscious and all that kind of stuff. People go through all kinds of things in teenage period. They have a depression, they have dark thoughts, and all that is common. And yet, you lump that all up and say, because you're in the wrong body. Do you know, the 14-year-old can walk into the school, uh, and, uh, and they can be referred to gender clinic, and receive testosterone, I mean, girl, if it's a girl, receiving testosterone in the first visit. Kaiser will give it to you as well. Right? You get a hormone treatment in the first visit. That is today. And, and, and so we have lumped in all these things. And because why? Because people are making money. So extreme mood swings. Depressions, sleep, sleepness, and, and angst, inferiority complex, uncertainty about many things, and all that can be lumped into gender dysphoria. And now, in, in the junior high schools and all that, if you come out uh, as trans, and, and there's immediate popularity. Acceptance. People and other kids, because we raise our kids like that. You know, you be nice to underdog. Then if a person comes out, oh, we are so happy and all that kind of stuff. And all this affirmation and all that they didn't have before. Now it's much easier to do that than proclaim that they're Christian. Right? And this is why even the secular study is saying Instagrams are dangerous, especially for a preteen, uh, you know, adolescent girls and all that. Because body image and all that, they compare and, and all the wrong things are going back and forth. And they, they hate themselves as a result. They cut themselves. You know, all those kind of things are happening. And these are ve very vulnerable times. And they don't need more confusion or misdirection with the irreparable damages for the rest of their lives. Even though there's a, a very good study that is done, and this uh, trans people who went through, that almost all the cases is ir irreversible, irreparable. And the group of doctors coming out say, it's okay, it's always reversible, and all that, without the study, once again. This is scary things happening. Even the professionals are jumping in and making money and being accepted and become a superstar uh, things. So let, let, me, let me go back a little bit. In our human history, do we have this stuff like this? Yes, we did. Even in, in India, uh, the Hijra group, uh, there, is a, there are about 10 million people. Uh, and they um, mostly male. Uh, they... they actually went for third gender in, in the uh, Indian constitution, right? And they mutilate themselves. That's an initia initiation right. And they, most of them work as, as a sex workers uh, and, and the gypsy life, right? So if you know the history, gypsies that we see in Europe actually began uh, in India. So... Uh, the, the, the people there, they live in Pakistan, they live in India, they live in Bangladesh. Uh, and, and, you know, that's the only group that, that historically that actually, is because they cannot give birth, all the people with that kind of issues come there uh, and all that. And another, another thing we see is in, in Greece, uh, about 7th century B.C., Greece to about 2nd century B.C., um, the, these... Um, uh, the, Greek male is introduced to sex, uh, not to a woman, but to an older man. Um, uh, 
pederasty is called, it's a love of a boy. It, direct, uh, uh, translation is, it's not homosexual activity as, as you think, but it's asexual nevertheless. Uh, it's an older male uh, with a post-puberty boy, and uh, that's the introduction. And it lasted hundreds of years. Right? Socrates writes about it. Plato writes about it. Aesop, the fable, Aesop, uh, you know, has a comment about it. And uh, th those are the things, right? But then these people move on and ha not become homosexual. They, they have their families and all that kind of stuff. And, and throughout human history, there are these type of things. And those communities and societies fell. Except that we see uh, this Hizra, uh, this uh, uh, eunuch, word is eunuch, uh, they, they, you know, uh, remove uh, male sex organ in uh, the Indian uh, group people, uh, and that is like people joining in, it's not, you know, growing by itself. And they are, they are very poor uh, uh, strata of people. So, um, that's, that's, uh, that's what it is. So I, I wanna kinda give you uh, stats here. One of the most extensive study done uh, in this so-called gender uh, dysphoria is in UK. It's about several decades long. In their, in their study, uh, genuine people, I'm not agreeing with this, I'm just presenting it, uh, genuine people who have this, this you know, um, discomfort about uh, the body and what they believe is about 0.1%. Uh, a point zero one percent, one in ten thousand, right? Uh, so one in ten thousand, overwhelmingly male, male ever since they're like two years old and whatever else. But once they clear the puberty, their their the hormonal changes, their physical body change, about seventy of them have no uh, you know uh, impact on that. They go on and become just just a regular uh, male and, and all that. Out of about 30%, uh, some of them choose uh, hormone uh, treatment and all that, and, and they seem to be settled down as well. Um, but women feeling this way is very rare. It's about one in 100,000. It's like an entire school district to one girl or something like that. That should be right proportion, right? One in 10,000, definitely bigger than the size of your high school and all that. But this is a, a recent uh, survey done and uh, I forgot the name of the book. And, and um, uh, there are a bunch of books written by feminists against transgender because what they fought for, these men are coming and taking it away and then making women uh, life more, more dangerous. And uh, they, they, they do a lot of uh, research and all that. Um, uh, abolition of gender or sexes or one book and, and there are other things. But you cannot buy an Amazon anymore. They taking it down from Amazon. That's the problem. Uh, that's another thing that I'll be talking about. Anyway, this survey, seventh grade girls in walk school district like LA and whatever else, depending on a teacher, between seven to 30% of girls say they are trans. They're in the wrong body. Now, let me go back. This, this study done by decades, several decades, about 60, 70 years, say girl, in the girl's case, is 0.001%. One out of 100,000 is normal. Now we are talking about 7 to 30% of girls are saying that they're in the wrong body. Think about this implication. This is conditioning of the society, right? And thoughts. Now, what they do is that they get a puberty blocker, so they stop the hormone, and so their body doesn't change, voice doesn't change, and all that. And on that, and the, uh, almost immediately, many of them go to mas mastectomy, right? Removal of breast, right? This, these are we are talking about 14, 15 year old girls, right? A and um, you know, and they're in a testosterone uh, 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 regime and, and all that kind of stuff. And there are hundreds of girls who are now in deep trance. So they went through that and they, they realized, oh, I, I'm a girl. And so they're coming back. And uh, uh, after all this treatment and all that, almost all of them are infertile for sure. All right? 
the hundred, almost 100% hundred infertile. But the thing is, if medical and pharmaceutical companies often fund these activities. And one of the well-known person, and I don't, I don't remember the name, is the heir of this big uh, pharmaceutical company, and he's the one putting in millions of dollars uh, on back on this, right? And media groups, as you know, I mentioned before. All of them proclaim that all their unhappiness would disappear if they proceed with the transition. This irreversible, irreparable um, process is done based on the feeling of 14, 15 year old boy and a girl. We don't even let them drive. We don't even let them drink. We don't even let them vote. But not physical data, but only their feeling they can get testosterone and estrogen treatment. This is how ridiculous, this is, we are swallowing this up. And so, Pastor, oh, it's not happening. I'm telling you, it's happening right now. I, 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 I'll tell you that. Why is this? Now, it's the same thing. And he's been doing, doing this from the beginning of the world. All right? The serpent said to women, you surely will not die. For God knows, in that day you eat from it, your eyes will be open." And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, yeah, I say, it's reversible. Come on, there are some doctors say it's reversible and all that. And I say, sure, you're not going to die. And uh, in fact, you're going to be so happy. All your problems, depressions, and, and gloomy thoughts, and, and the fear of getting, getting accepted, all that will be gone. It's all, all done. It's a magic pill. That's a lie of Satan from the beginning. Let me put it this way right now. Gender reassignment is deceptive, dishonest, immoral, unethical, most, mostly irreversible, and rebellion against God, the Creator. You know, let's say a woman go through mastectomy, removing her breast, and have a testosterone, uh, you know, treatment all the way her life, and even had a uh, uh, prosthetic sexual organ, you know, surgery and all that. Is she a man? No. It's a false man. Right? Chromosomically different. You are not. It's a false. Even if you went through, you believe in it, you went through the whole thing, your body says, no, you are not. You're false. And yet... We believe that that will help and that will do. No, it is dishonest and immoral, unethical, and more than anything else, it's a rebellion against God. Now, let me, let me even say what, how, how, how flimsily this argument is built. You know, these, these people who are uh, speaking for trans, transgender and all that and said they, don't, they deny physical data, right? Your, your, your boy's body girl's body, doesn't matter, right? What you believe in, what you believe you are matters, right? At the same time, they also deny social stereotyping. You know, boys are, uh, you know, more athletic. Uh, they, they have a ball game, you know, whatever else, or, or stronger, or, or they like blue, color blue and whatever else. They reject all of that. And yet, when a teenager walks into their office and a girl says, I like the color blue, I like to hang out with the boys. That very qualification, they, they, uh, social stereotyping they rejected becomes the evidence to support that she is in the wrong body. You see how foolish this is? This is a just total nonsense. The very thing they have rejected, if they needed this selective use of corrupt data to support the hypothesis, and, and that ruins people's lives. And these young people, for the rest of their life, they have to be on a, a hormone treatment and whatever else. And you'll be surprised. You, you get your kids, go to good school, finish medical school, and when they're matching up their, their, their you know, specialties and all that, 
transition surgery will be one of the most lucrative field. What are you going to do as a believer? You're going to butcher people? And that's where we are right now as a society. Just gender rejection has a deep root. This is where the gospel comes in. And this is why it's such, it's not just social issue. This is affront against God, rebellion against God. Gender rejection is a form of self-rejection. Self-loathing, which leads to self-abasement, which is manifest expression of the latent hatred toward God because ultimately, God is the one who assigns gender. This is offense before God. This is blasphemy. More often times, the children are having this, this, uh, this you know, gender issue. They're cutters. They cut themselves. They use substance. Many of them join in like, you know, uh, anarchical group. You know, they go and vandalize things. and There's a pented anger that needs to be expressed. Uh, and, and, you know, um, they, they do that in many other ways. And gender is one of them. And you're destroying your body. And this is a demonic because the enemy cannot stand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are the only higher being that not only give birth to offspring, but spiritual beings. There's no other creation like us, that we bear the image of God. And because of that, demons hate us more than anything else, particularly reproductive area. That's why we are so messed up sexually and all that. There's an attack of all kind, and the enemy is all out on destroying this. And this is why this is a dangerous uh, path uh, for people to take. Now, normal people, normal kids getting into this, of course, they have no idea. They just, you know, people say, all oh, your problems will go away. And you, you have problems because of this and all that. But there's a layers of lies and lies and lies and bringing that up to this point. Scripture said very clearly, he created, God created them male and female, and he blessed them. I, I, I don't want you to miss this. God created us male and female, and he blessed us with that. Right? And, and, and that is such an important thing. The gender is a gift. Your race is your gift. Your family whether you're happy or not, is a gift. That's a grounding, grounding block upon which you build your life identity, your self-esteem, your purpose in life, all springs out of that. And once you start rejecting yourself, suicide is a form of rejection, self-rejection. Now we are focusing on our gender, and in that, we are rejecting that, and and we consider that not as a gift, but a curse, once again. The enemy has, has been lying to us. In Jude, verses 7 and 8, it says this, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming. Think about this. Not objective studies, historical, scientific, also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority, authority particularly of God, and revile against angelic majesties. And he's, he's describing the type of people in the latter days. And this, this is where we are right now. And uh, but United States still, have we? Well, let me tell you this. 
President Biden, first day of his presidency, he has undid what President Trump did. And now, in federal government, you cannot defy men or women. And, and, and because of that, it, only a few months later, and the House passed this Equality Act. This is uh, February 25th of 2021, as if this is something that's going to help this country. This bill prohibits discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity in areas including public accommodations and facilities, education, federal funding, employment, housing, credit, and jury system, and on and on and on. And this is a summary of it. The underlying part is this. This bill prohibits an individual from being denied access to share facility, including restroom, a locker room, a dressing room, and that is in accordance with individual's gender identity. This is what it is today okay I don't know that's a, that's a ramify yet but this this is where where it passed and last February that is men can walk into a woman's bathroom uh, and, and you know use that bathroom and nobody can say hey stop it you can't no because this equality access though so when you're in a restaurant in the evening and with your family and whenever your kids want to go to the bathroom, send them over there and they, he, he or she is encountering this guy six foot two in a woman's dress with heavy makeup in the bathroom alone. How would you feel that? That's a reality. You don't even know whether this individual is a stable person. But that's the world we have created and this is there as if this you know, with all these foreign policy issues and the energy issues and the inflation and recession and all that, and this was the most important thing they had to pass. And that's where we are. Because physical, objective data doesn't matter. What we feel is the most important thing. And that's where we are. Once again, we have turned God's gift into a curse yet again. You are burdened with this wrong gender. No wonder you're having a horrible time. No wonder you feel awkward, socially awkward. No wonder you don't have a friend. And if you go through the process, you'll have a bunch of friends and all your problems will be gone. The lie of Satan. Let me remind you God's word once again. I, I used this last week. But you, God, form my inward parts. You woo me in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. In this psalm, this is proper relationship with the Creator who has made us male and female and blessed us. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. My friend was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. A skillfully rolled in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. God who is in complete control. God who made us fearfully and wonderfully, not haphazardly, not mistakenly, not uncaringly. This gender, who we are, is a gift of God, not a curse, not something to be corrected. Therefore, teach your children to abide in the word of God, in the Stand on the rock of Jesus, surrounded by the sea of lies. That's the only way to survive. Teach them to thank and praise him for your children are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. With your specific genders, according to God's wisdom and grace. It is not an accident or arbitrarily assigned. It's a gift of God. 
you know, when I do premarital counseling, I, I tell them, you know, especially the young brides and all, I say, don't ever become ajumma in your life. Ajumma is a Korean word, the middle-aged woman who gave up being a woman. Let it all hang out, and her manners are terrible, and he yells at people, pick a fight with, a, you know, a people, and, and all that. That's, a, that's a ajumma, right? Stay charming, beautiful. That's a gift of God, that gender, right? And some people downplay, you know, the physical attractiveness in church. That's a lie of Satan. That, in the, in the Bible, the body, soul, and spirit, we, we are redeemed. All of that is redeemed from the Lord. We have a responsibility to take care of our bodies, right? You got to stay, you know, nobody is like, you know, like models and whatnot. That, that's, these models are, some are crazy looking as well. But, you know, it, it's not just that. It's a charming, it's a, uh, the, how you carry yourself. Very important, right? And, 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 and I told guys, uh, never to become ajashi. Ajashi is counterpart of ajumma. He's, he's a middle-aged man. He just, you know, gave up being, you know, attractive. He just let it all go to pots, you know, um, kind of thing. Why? Because gender is a gift. Your body is a gift. Your soul is a gift. Your spirit is a gift. You are fearfully and wonderfully made according to wisdom of God, including people with special needs, special challenges. It's God's wisdom. And we can say, as we read in Romans chapter, can a, can a clay complain to God about that? You know, I, I was thinking like, I wish I was a little taller. You know, I, I, we have this little stepper like about about eight inches or something i use in the kitchen to get something i get up there and say whoa view is different from here <laughs> you know like i wish i was a little a little taller but when i get into airplane and, and and you know like and then i see tall guy next to me like all you know having difficult time i just cross my leg <laughs> and thank the lord you know and and, and just there are so many things um, out of God's wisdom he has given us. If you don't affirm yourself, including your gender, nobody can affirm your gender. You have to affirm yourself. You are blessed. And then, and then and Paul goes and says this. And this is a passage that we read today. It doesn't matter where you come from or where you have been. And, and you know, People naively think Paul's world, they don't have a problem like this. You know, this, you think this is a problem? The, Paul's world is messed up, really messed up. Let me read that. Or do you think, uh, do you know unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? All right? You know, here goes a lie that's preached from, from the pulpit. Everything is okay. Grace covers everything. This is Paul who talks about grace of God, and he writes to this, this Corinthians, and says, These people are not saved. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, uh, brothers and sisters, this is premarital sex. There are evangelical schools have a more premarital sex problem than secular school. Right now, though you're fornicate, nor idolater, uh, idolaters and other ter, other extra marriage, uh, marital, you know, sexual issues. Nor effeminate. Effeminate is the word they choose to translate. But this word is a male temple prostitute. Right? The Paul's world is filled with with this uh, both male and female temple prostitute. In Artemis worship, the Diana, Roman god Diana, Greek name Artemis, and uh, you know, in the Book of Acts, there have been riot because they thought Paul was, you know, challenging that and all that kind of stuff. But Paul's world was messed up. 
in this world, he's preaching the gospel of purity and all that kind of things. He says, these people um, effeminate, effeminate and homosexual. Effeminate is the one who assumes female position in the homosexual sex. And homosexuals are the dominant one in that, in that uh, homosexual relationship. But not only that, it, it comes with a, a um, uh, the, what, is, what, what is it, the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, violence uh, or, or, or something twisted, right? The meaning to it. And he actually goes and specific word he used to describe and these kind of people will not do it. And, and uh, you know, all that. But I want you to know that the sexual sin is not the worst sin. I want you to know. He goes on, thieves and covetous. How many of you been covetous? Right? And, and, and drunkard, that's why don't drink. Don't get drunk revilers and swindlers and all that. So these people, well, no matter what you say, you know, you know, what you think you are, once again, this postmodern, even though your physical life and all that doesn't show that you're Christian, as long as you believe that you're Christian, you're Christian, that doesn't wash the water here, right? And now here, he says, hey, don't kid yourself. And all that. And he points out these guys. Because this, this was not uncommon. This is very common in, in that society. And then he goes on to say, 11, such were some of you. Some of, some of the Corinthian Christians were temple male prostitutes. Some of them, you know, in other, uh, uh, all other kind of a uh, color background here. But some of you are that, but you're washed by what? Blood of Jesus. There's no sin that's greater than the blood of Jesus. Amen. And because of that, and no matter where you come from, no matter what your history is, doesn't matter. Come to Jesus. And let your life be cleaned up. Sanctified. And then he goes to say, but since you have become the children of God. Now, through that, you have become children of God. Realize this. What is that? And he says, all things are lawful. And he, he goes on to say and all that. And yet he says this, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Lord will bless your body as you employ your body for the glory of God. That's what he's saying. You are saved by the blood of Jesus, your body, soul, and spirit. It's not that God saved your spirit and left your body and soul somewhere else. You are entirely saved for eternity. All right? Through the cross of Jesus, we belong to God entirely and eternally. This is a very important piece of theology. This is why Jesus came to be a full human, full human body, full human soul, full human spirit. That's a fully God and fully man. That's the theology, Christology. Very important thing because what he did not assume, he did not redeem. That's a very important piece of theology. And that's why God has redeemed us, the body, soul, and spirit. And that's why we are responsible in our walk with God, body, soul, and spirit. And then he goes in the final uh, punchline is this, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. You are not your own. Now you belong to him. For you have been bought with a price, not a cheap price. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Therefore glorify God in your body. Paul talks about it all the time. Brothers and sisters, therefore, we ourselves have to conduct ourselves, flee from immorality, right? And the people come from all kinds of background. I'm not here to judge or anything like that. But you are welcome to come into the kingdom of God under the blood of Jesus. But once you come into the kingdom of God under the blood of Jesus, you don't go in and out and in and out and 
cheapen the blood, the grace of Jesus Christ. In fact, though, if you live more outside than inside, then probably you are kidding yourself like postmoderns. Your record, objective record shows you are not, but you think you feel like you are. You are kidding yourself. That's not reality. That's why Paul wrote this to Corinthian believers. But the finality is this. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So take away, what is it? Through the cross of Jesus, we belong to God entirely and eternally, body, soul, and spirit. Another thing is this. We are given the opportunity to prophetically live this glorious truth on earth and glorify God with our body, which Paul called it living sacrifice. This is for you and for your children. And especially pray daily for our little ones growing up, especially going through adolescent period, and they are bombarded even, even from kindergarten and with all kind of so-called entertainment and whatever other means to normalize something that is immoral according to the scripture. And, and the type of world they are living in is scary. And yet, parents don't pray. And that's even more scary. And brothers and sisters, that we are given this opportunity. This is a gift as well. How shall we live then? What's our, what's our work? What's our contribution to the kingdom of God? It's not just being activist. First pray that we will be in the right place and approach with purity, humility, speaking the truth in love. And, and seek out where the needs are first. Show compassion and care rather than damning and judging. And yet, truth is truth, and false is false. And the reason I'm going through the series is because we are already conditioned in the layers of lies, and we are pointing that out, and then let the Scripture talk to us, so that people of God know how to live. Let's bow our heads. Now, um, if there is any of you who have not accepted Jesus as a Savior yet, and I want to say this to you, this whirlwind of lies, only way to discern truth is through God and His words. And without your relationship with Jesus, who died for you, and in His blood we are washed anew, no good works, no amount of good works or knowledge will save us. Only through the blood of Jesus, the Son of God. Invite him to be your Lord and Savior. Simple, just prayer, very sincere prayer. Lord, come into my life. Be my Savior and Lord. Cover me with your blood that I may be righteous in the sight of the Lord. Send me your Holy Spirit that I may live this life according to your purpose and your will. And God will answer that prayer every time and you pray sincerely. And those of us who pray that prayer, and yet there's so many things pulling us apart and we are ignorant of, of what the enemy is doing. And we, we have sinned not praying for our loved ones. And this is time to pray. We need prayers. We need warriors of prayers. We need people to study the scripture, know the truth. And not only for ourselves, but our next generation. It's a serious work. Pray to God that you will pray. Help you to pray. Study the scripture. Be faithful and stand on the truth.